So I thought I'd start off today's session with a little audience participation, which I'd like to do, uh, by a show of hands. Uh, if I can see, how many of you know where the Dow Jones Industrial Average is within 1,000 points? OK, good. Uh, how many of you know where the 30-year Treasury is within 500 basis points? Um, <laughs> current vacancy rates for Class A properties. OK, good, a little less. What brand paper towels did Donald Trump throw out to the Puerto Rican need? No one knows that one. Uh, how many kids dropped out of high school last year? And I ask that rhetorically because which one of these questions do you think is a better leading indicator to how we're doing as a society? So for those of you who don't know me, I like to think of myself as an evolved capitalist or a recovering philanthropist. You see, for the vast majority of my career, I was both a capitalist and a philanthropist, and I struggled at both. As a capitalist, I was very fortunate. I was one of three partners in, in one of the world's largest hedge funds. Uh, and for years, I struggled with almost a moral discomfort that came with the, I don't know, the, the, the recognize, recognizing that the only measure of success in the industry I was in was just how much money you made. Um, and I'll tell you, I had always thought, to be honest, that. Uh, that with wealth would come happiness. And, and I've got 30 years of proof that there's very little correlation between wealth and happiness. I concluded years ago that the only thing that wealth can guarantee is a more comfortable form of misery. But by the way, for the record, if you're going to be miserable, you might as well be comfortable. <laughs> I just think that. So I guess it was about 20 years ago uh, that I also recognized my lack of balance. And uh, I went on a journey, what I called my 50 over 50. I interviewed 50 people over the age of 50. Um, I interviewed bankers, money managers, teachers, policemen, firemen, um, rich people, poor people, homeless people, doctors, and even lawyers. But they tended to be the most self-loathing of the group. Um, and I asked each a very simple question. Are you happy? And if so, why? And if you're not, why? And I concluded that happiness for me was a four-step program. Number one being materialism. Let's be serious. It's OK to want nice things, but the reality is that there's a decreasing marginal marginal return on happiness with that fifth car. It just doesn't make you happy. Number two is love. Uh, and you think that's peculiar. Why is love only two out of four that would make me happy? Uh, and that's because if you're an ambitious person, audience participation, who's ambitious? Okay, if you're an ambitious person, you will spend 80% of your waking hours away from those you love. So you can't rely upon those you love to make you happy, but I promise you that the alternative is if you're not in love, it can make you unhappy. Think about it. I always say there's four places in a relationship you can be. Number one, greatest place is happily married, right? Great place to be. Number two, happily single, fantastic. Number three, unhappily single. But the worst fucking place you can be is unhappily married, <laughs> right? So don't rely upon happy love to make you happy, but I promise you that unhappy love will make you unhappy. The third for me to be happy was the opportunity to achieve, and not achievement itself, but the opportunity to get out there, to put on my Gladiator outfit, and, and do my best. is that old adage saying that there's nothing better than a hard day's work. I found that the people that were really happy were people that got out there to do battle every day. And fourth for me, that I realized would make me happy, was power. And not the Dr. Evil power to control and manipulate, but rather the power to have a positive impact on other people's lives. The reality was is the teachers and the policemen and the firemen all seemed pretty happy when compared to me. So I guess in my desire to have a positive impact, I started moonlighting as a philanthropist, where I also struggled. And not with the moral discomfort that came from making money off of other people's misfortunes, but rather with the emotional discomfort that came from throwing money at other people's misfortunes. Because I found very quickly with the philanthropy that my wife and I were doing, is we were really funding organizations that were putting band-aids on issues. We were treating issues. We were not holding these organizations accountable, nor were they scalable nor sustainable. And in fact, we concluded very on, early on in our philanthropic endeavors is that we really, what we were doing was just funding legacies of dependency. So nearly 20 years ago, I came to the following conclusion. If you want to treat a problem in society, then the government and philanthropy are just fine. But if you want to cure, really cure, you have to harness market forces to create sustainable solutions that are scalable and stick. And with that knowledge, I did something my wife thought was impossible of most men, and this man in particular, I evolved. Because men, we don't tend to evolve particularly well. 
And I evolved, I evolved from an investor whose sole metric of success was making money to one that believed they could also, while making money, have a positive impact on those communities in which I was investing, what I call social impact. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term social impact, let me help you. It's not an asset class. It's not philanthropy. It's not government. And it is surely not an investment strategy that sacrifices yield. Simply put, the way I look at it is it just recognizes, it's a strategy that recognizes that doing good and doing well needn't be exclusive. It focuses on marketplaces where there's an existing mismatch between supply and demand. And where the traditional investor has been the government and our philanthropy, neither of which proven to be particularly innovative in creating scalable solutions. I mean, think about it. For years, we have segregated profits and purpose. And our reliance upon philanthropy and government to tackle issues like education, like housing, and like healthcare have actually handicapped our outcomes. It's no secret that we have some pretty daunting challenges, right? I mean, I, who's anxious? I mean, I'm anxious that you're not anxious. How can you not be anxious with everything that's going on in this country and in the world? But in spite of these problems, I stand here as an optimist, because the reality is, is daunting challenges lead to generational investment opportunities. So I imagine that most of us would agree, quite simply, that one of the biggest problems we face in this country is the disparity of wealth. Right? Now, raise your hand if you agree with that. When 1% of a country controls 99% of its wealth, you undermine the very fabric that holds a society together. Right? Well, I just don't think that's our problem. Disparity of wealth is a problem. Now, it's more extreme than ever today, but unless you want this to be the United Socialist States of America, I believe that we need to have disparity of wealth. This country was built on disparity of wealth. The problem we have today is not disparity of wealth, but rather it's disparity of hope. Because as long as the 99% believes in the feasibility of the American dream, and I grew up the 99%, I believe that with hard work, with a great education, if my parents weren't burdened with excessive rent, if I had a little bit of luck, maybe a lot of luck in my case, you could actually become the 1%. But the reality is today that there are tens and tens of millions of people in this country who feel as though they've been foreclosed from the American dream. Think about the single black woman in East Baltimore, the mother of two children, well, she's not working one job, she's working two jobs, maybe three jobs. She's coming home to a shitty apartment in a shitty neighborhood, and she's spending 50, maybe 60% of her income on rent at the expense of food security, at the expense of health security, at the expense of retirement security. I'm sorry, at the expense of hope. And to add insult to injury, her two sons are relegated to a public school district with a likelihood of them graduating high school below 40%, graduating college below 1%, ending up in jail before the age of 35 greater than 50%. Where is there hope? And when you pull hope from the equation, the only word that can fill that void is despair. And I believe it's the intense despair that leads to the intensive violence that we see in this country, but it also leads to the political circuses that we see today. Listen, not being political, but a vote for Donald Trump was not a vote for hope. It was a vote in defiance of two parties that have turned their backs on the social injustices of tens of millions of families that suffer from social determination. That's just a fact. So I know what you're all thinking. Actually, I have no idea because I can't see any of you. <laughs> but if I could, I know what you would be thinking. You'd be thinking, Bobby, this sounds great. But you're all business people, and I have to believe that you're thinking any time you superimpose a social agenda on a financial return, you're going to have to sacrifice yields, right? And I'm a fiduciary to my investors, so who am I to say I'm going to earn you less yields to do something good in the world? But I'm in the unique position that over the last 25 years, I've proven that doing good and doing well needn't be exclusive. In fact, there's a symbiotic relationship that can drive superior risk-adjusted returns when compared to more traditional investment opportunities because I'm not speculating. I'm not trying to create demand. I'm only fulfilling an existing mismatch between supply and demand and things like education, healthcare, and housing, where the traditional investor has been the government and or philanthropy, and they're not particularly good. And the reality is I can generate non-correlated returns, which I like to call alpha, because the demand for my product, for my infrastructure, is non-correlated to the broader market indices. 
what happens to the demand for high-end retail when the Dow Jones collapses? What happens to the demand for high-end condos when inflation skyrockets or unemployment increases? What happens to the demand for charter school seats? There's 1.2 million kids on a wait list today for a great charter school. At $20,000 a school seat, that's a $22 billion infrastructure opportunity. What happens to that demand when the markets turn south? Absolutely nothing. That's called alpha. So, as many of you may know, my first initiative and foray into the uh, social impact space was back in 1998 with my friend Magic Johnson. And I was sitting at a Laker game with Magic, and he asked me what I was working on, and I said I was working on an urban fund. Now, who knows what Magic's real name is? It's Irvin. So, of course, over the din of the crowd, he heard me say I'm working on an Irvin fund, and he got that big shit grin of his and said, I cannot believe that you want to do a fund named after me. And I said, I cannot believe your ego's that large or your hearing's that bad. I said, I want to do an urban fund, and if you want it to be called the Irvin Urban Fund, that's fine. He goes, well, what are we going to call it? And at that point in time, I was at Canyon Partners, and uh, I said, well, we're going to call it the Canyon Johnson Urban Fund. And he looks at me and goes, I love it, the Johnson Canyon Urban Fund. <laughs> and I looked up at him, because anatomically, I have to look up at him. And he always looked down upon me, which anatomically he had to do. And I said, Canyon Johnson. He goes, Johnson Canyon. So I said, of course, let me introduce you to the golden rule. He goes, what's that? I said, he who has the goal, that'd be me, rules. So it's going to be Canyon Johnson. And he actually didn't care. But we did have our first argument the next day. He asked me, how long did I think it would take to raise a private equity real estate fund focused on investing in minority communities? Well, to me, it was, it was obvious. It would take six months. I mean, think of the compelling fundamentals of how quickly the minority communities were growing, the huge mismatch between supply and demand, the great track record that we had built, and my God, he's Magic Johnson, who wouldn't invest? It's gonna take us six months. And Irvin looked down at me and said, God, I thought I was getting a smart partner. I said, well, what do you mean by that? He goes, it's gonna take us two years to raise this fund because the allocators of capital look like you, Bobby, and they don't understand the opportunities that exist in the urban markets. So I bet him six months. He bet me two years. Raise your hand if you have a child looking for a summer internship and say that Bobby was right. Six months. Raise your hand. And who thinks Irvin was right with two years? Well, everyone needs to raise their hands because it took us two years and six months to raise the first fund. And you laugh, but it was really disheartening. And it was really disheartening because I was embarrassed as we went around the country trying to impress upon institutional investors that doing good and doing well didn't have to be segregated. Fact is, it took us two years and six months. We raised $300 million with great financial returns over the following five years. We were able to raise a second fund. It took us two and a half months to raise $600 million. We raised a third fund, a $1 billion fund, uh, and that took us about two and a half weeks. A decade later, and probably as a result of my struggles as a philanthropist, I, I associated, I partnered with uh, Andre Agassi. People know who Andre is? Uh, he could be your next year keynote speaker, equally as follically impaired <laughs> as I am. Just keep the trend going. The year after, we could have Michael Jordan. Um, it could be great. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll recruit him. So I partnered with Andre to tackle one, of, tackle one of our most daunting challenges in America, and that is public education. Thinking about it, think about it. We're number one in the world in what we spend per capita for public education, but somehow, we're 25th to 35th in standardized testing internationally. How is that possible? Number one. Number two, we drop one million kids out of high school every year. And that's a horrible thing because these kids are eight times more likely to go to jail. And as a taxpayer, all of us here, we spend three times as much to incarcerate than we do to educate. It's disheartening to me to believe that only one third of our kids in 10th grade in urban schools are proficient in math, science, English, history. One has to ask, are kids failing high school or are high schools failing kids? And I took it upon myself to try to do something in Los Angeles as a philanthropist. And a little bit of my money, mostly Bill and Melinda Gates' money and Eli Broad's money and the Walton family, we created a not-for-profit called Pacific Charter School. And with that money, we tackled the biggest impediment to charter school growth, which wasn't the kids. There's millions of kids on the wait list. It was the facilities themselves. And we took this pocket of money, we put up $40 million, and over eight years we built 38 schools for 15,000 kids. 
and you would think that we would be running around butt naked high-fiving each other. Well, not so much, Bill. And the reality is, is we were incredible failures in my mind. Because while we had built 15,000 seats, there were 45,000 kids on the wait list. I had read Andre Agassi's book called Open. Anyone read his book? It made an incredible, incredible, vulnerable, open uh, soliloquy on his life. And I recognize he shared the same passion and frustration. Uh, he had built his own. By the way, for the record, Andre is an eighth grade dropout and always believed that he was incredibly fortunate to be able to fall back upon his tennis, whereas most kids that grew up in the same socioeconomic environment he had don't have that luxury. So Andre, as a philanthropist, had built his own K through 12 public charter school in Las Vegas. And by the time I had met Andre, he too felt like an incredible failure. He'd had two graduating classes. 100% of his kids had gone on to high school, but yet he had 3,000 kids on the wait list. So Andre and I teamed up to do what we had to do because I went back to Bill and I went back to Eli and I went back to the Walton family and said, and it was about 2010 in the heat of the recession, and what's least available in recession? Philanthropy. So I needed to raise more money to tackle the problems these kids had, and none of them were buying it. Andre couldn't raise more money, so I convinced Andre that to truly scale, we had to harness market forces, and that meant raise a for-profit capital markets-driven fund to build schools. And Andre and I had an amazing journey for a year. We went out and we met with four different kinds of investors. The first investor were the unionists. Um, I managed billions of dollars for Cal Sturs. And one of my dear friends and great investor was Mike DeRay. Anyone know who Mike is? Mike runs the real estate group for Cal Sturs. Very smart guy. And I remember calling Mike on a Monday morning. I said, Mike, I have a tremendous opportunity for you. We're going to change the world. He goes, I love you, Bobby. You're a great manager for me. How big is the fund? I said, 200 million. He said, I'll take half the fund. What's the asset class? I said, well, hang on a second. Let me, let me embellish for a little bit. Let me tell you about the underlying fundamentals. This is about the health of society. So he liked that. I'm steering him towards health care. This marketplace is growing at a CAGR of 12% per annum. There's a huge wait list. It's backed by the taxing authority. So I've got them all into it, something about health care. He goes, what's the asset class? I said, are you firm, Mike? Will you do the fund? He goes, absolutely, I'll take half the fund. I said, do you swear? He goes, I swear. I go, do you pinky swear? He goes, I pinky swear. What's the asset class? I said, charter schools. Now, for those of us who are old enough to have had analog phones, remember the dial tone you would get? when someone would hang up. That's what, you don't get it on cell phones, but you get it, you know, when I grew up with the rotary phones. And he hung up on me. So I called him back and said, Mike, what in the world would be wrong with investing in charter schools? He says, Bobby, I manage money on behalf of the teachers' unions, and charter schools are the nemesis of the teachers' unions. You're undermining the teachers' union. To which I responded, oh, quite the contrary, Mike. I, in fact, am incredibly pro-union. I just am representing the children's union. And if education is going to be about adults, we're really in trouble as a society. Mike said, love you, Bobby. I got the dial tone again. So the unionists weren't so receptive. Um, the capitalists, we met with a number of brilliant capitalists who candidly did not believe that one could do, and do, do good and well without sacrificing yield. They believed in the segregation of profits and purpose. So the capitalists weren't particularly interesting for us. Um, the communists were amazing, and I kid you not. So again, unionists not so good, capitalists not so good, the communists. Andre and I met with one of the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world, CIC, China Investment Corporation. And at the end of our presentation, the gentleman from China said, Mr. Turner, Mr. Agassi, I love your fund. I will take the entire fund. At which point, Andre leaned into the table. Now, for those of you who don't know Andre, he is an incredibly complicated man. And the best way I can describe it is when I first met Andre, six weeks into our relationship, he called me on a Sunday morning and said, Bobby, I need help with math. And I said, well, that's awesome. I need help with my forehand. To which he responded, I've seen your forehand. I don't need that much help. <laughs> and, OK, I've seen my forehand too. And he, I go, what's the problem? He goes, I need help with multiplication. My son, Jaden, who was 10 at the time, has a math test on Monday, and I cannot explain to Jaden in what universe a minus three times a minus three could be a positive thing. Three shitty things happen compounded by three more shitty things. I'm swimming in shit, Bobby. Because how is that a good thing? I said, 
let me ask my wife. So I looked at my wife, I said, Lauren, she goes, explain to Andre the following. If you do a bad thing to a bad person, that's a good thing. <laughs> right, smart lady. So I say, Andre, if you do it, he goes, I heard what she said, but what's that got to do with minus three times minus three? To which I said, I don't know. I actually don't know why minus three times minus three is a positive nine, but it's just one of those tenets in math, one of those rules that you have to memorize. Just accept it. And I kid you not, he said to me, maybe you can live your life that way, but I can't. Now, fast forward a year, the government of China has just said they will take the entire fund Andre leans in for his question. It was an obvious question. Why? Why does the government of China want to invest in a private equity fund focused on education in America? To which the gentleman responded, Mr. Turner, Mr. Agassiz, you might not be aware of this, but your country is indebted to my country to the tune of nearly $2 trillion. And none of us at the table today will be alive to see that debt repaid. Therefore, we, the government of China, have got to rely upon the next generation of Americans to grow your economy out of the debt you owe us, and you are failing miserably. And Andre looks at me and goes, wow, that was cold serving a pie, wasn't it? I'm like, yeah. He goes, we're not going to take that money, are we? And I said, no, we're not going to take that money unless we can't find it anywhere else. <laughs> In which case, you're going to jump on an airplane, go to Shanghai, and play every exhibition match necessary to get that money back. But we didn't. So we struck out with the unionists, we struck out with the capitalists, we struck out with the communists. But thank God for the realists. And the realists were those investors like the University of Michigan, like Citibank, like Prudential Insurance, like a number of family offices, who said, what are the consequences of us not investing in public education? And if the answer is it's unconscionable, then you invested with us. And I'm thrilled to say that in under five years, Andre and I and the entire Turner Agassiz Charter School team have built 80 schools across the country for 43,000 kids. We've changed the trajectory of tens of thousands of kids. We're positioned to build another 70 schools in the next three years. All in all, between Fund 1 and Fund 2, we'll be the 22nd largest school district in America. And you couldn't have done that with the government, and you couldn't have done it with philanthropy. And equally as amazing as our schools act as a reinforcing mechanism for the communities in which we invest. We did an amazing school for an organization called Rocket Ship Education in the Anacostia area of Washington, D.C., directly across the street from Woodland Terrace Public Housing, one of the most violent public housing projects in all of America. In under one year, since we opened the school, violent crimes have fallen by more than 50%. Now, is that because we built a school? Maybe they closed a local liquor store. But I have to believe that underserved communities, people that suffer from social injustice, from social determination, they've seen neglect of their communities. If all of a sudden they believe that they're worthy of an investment, like an amazing $35 million school, that will be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh, and by the way, while we've built these 80 schools, We've generated 10% returns for our investors, 1.5 equity multiple net of all fees. Social impact. And while that's pretty exciting, here's my dilemma, is no matter what we could do for those kids between the hours of 8 and 5, if they go home to an unsafe, unnurturing home environment, this is my segue, you're like, when's he going to talk about housing? <laughs> I told him to talk about housing. But if they go home to an unsafe, unnurturing home environment, Everything we accomplish goes out the window. Let's be serious. Everybody suffers when we don't have affordable workforce housing and close proximity to jobs. Family suffers. Productivity suffers. The environment suffers. And I'm not talking about, as David mentioned, I'm not talking about low-income housing. I'm talking about workforce housing for people that make too much money for subsidized housing, compliance-driven housing, but not enough money for home ownership. We call it the backbone, the fabric of society. Teachers, policemen, allied healthcare workers, municipal workers. And think of the fundamentals. Today, there are 43 million renter households in America. That will grow, by all estimates, by an additional 7 million over the next 10 to 12 years. One out of two renters, 50% of all renters, are rent burdened. 
That means they're spending more than 30 to 35% of their income on rent and utilities. One out of four is severely rent burdened. That's 15 million families in America who are spending over 50 or 60%. Anyone live up in the Bay Area or in New York City? Sometimes 70% of their income on rent at the expense of food security, at the expense of healthcare, education, retirement. It's just not sustainable. So the obvious solution for all of us here today is to do what? Let's build more affordable workforce housing, right? Here's the quagmire. You can't. Given the parameters of what it costs to build new, a for-profit developer, given the cost of land, given the cost of labor, financing, and materials, you cannot build new workforce housing, only charge 35% of someone's income for rent, and generate a market rate return. You just can't do it. So the problem is, is number one, huge demand. It's growing. There's no new supply because the economics don't work. And what's most disheartening to me is that our existing supply is shrinking. It just is. You see, every time B and C properties are coming on the market, they're being bought by an opportunistic investor who does one of two things. They scrape it to build a new luxury property or condo, or they improve it. Right? They put in new kitchens, they put in new bathrooms, they put in new common areas. And to get a return on their capital, what do they do? They raise rents on the very consumer who has seen no wage inflation for 25 years. And while I haven't figured out a way to build new, I have figured out a way to buy existing stock, to preserve its affordability, and at the same time, drive market returns. And I'm going to tell you about it because I'm open code, I'm open book. I want everyone to take these ideas because I'm not worried about competition. I'm worried that there's not competition. And if we're going to write the listing ship of a society where there's so many families suffering from the injustices of just where they live, it's just not right, it's not sustainable. So let's break it down to the basics quickly. Two ways, I'm a Wharton guy, two ways to drive profits. Number one, increase revenues, right? Well, we can't do that. If I'm going to buy a property, I can't increase revenues on the backbone of these families. Well, what's the other way to drive profitability? Reduce expenses. Well, what's the biggest expense of owning workforce housing? Turnover. I don't know if that's what you said, but I'm a politician, so if you said, you know, insurance. Turnover, exactly. That's right. <laughs> Fantastic. What did you say your name was? Um, but it's turnover. I mean, again, let's be serious. Go back to the scenario where you're working two or three jobs, you're coming home to a crappy apartment in a crappy neighborhood. I gotta believe you're not coming home and saying, God, I fucking love living here. You're not. So there's no pride in rendership, and with that, you have a very volatile and you have a very transient community. Well, what if you thought out of the box a little bit and you said, and I know this from, from my, my experiences with Magic uh, and with Andre in urban communities. What happens if we could create a pride and rendership? What happens if you enrich the community so the people said, well, you know something, this is a great place to live. And if you love where you live, you treat it differently. And if you love where you live, you're not going to move if you don't have to. And if you don't move and you can increase a tenant's duration of their, their lease from 24 months to 36 months, or maybe from 36 months to 48 months, guess what? You can drive profit margins by upwards of 20% without ever raising rent. So how do you do it? Well, what we do is we don't improve properties, we enrich them. And I enrich them with relevant community services, things like education, safety, and healthcare. And how do I do it? Well, first of all, I'm probably the only owner of workforce housing in the country that's also in the school business. I know where I'm building schools, and I partner with my schools. So by way of example, I may buy a wonderful property. I just built a K through seven uh, public charter school in South Dallas for KIPP, Knowledge is Power program. 700 kids, full stability. Right around the corner is a 400 unit workforce housing that's gonna come on the market in the next six months. And I'm gonna buy it. And by the way, I can match any other opportunity fund, Blackstone, BlackRock, Black Diamond, whatever, all, the, all, the, all these, you know, these funds that have the same money from the same investors who are all gonna bid it up, but I can bid the same price. And I can buy it for a 6% cap rate like they can, and rather than improving it, I'm going to enrich it. So what I do is of the 400 units, I take 3% and I put it in my pocket as a currency. Okay, and I have 12 units. The first place I go is to the school I just built. And I go with Carmen Maldonado. Carmen Maldonado is a former public school teacher, master's in education, she worked for the KIPP Foundation. We walk down to the KIPP school we just built. We sit down with the executive director and say, you know something? 
teachers are heroes. And no one's doing anything for teachers. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take five units in this apartment building, and we're going to subsidize housing for teachers. And in return for the subsidy, the currency that teachers will pay us is we're going to make a tutoring lounge. And every school night of every school day of every school year, there will be a teacher staffing that lounge for both cognitive and non-cognitive education for our kids. Now, if you live in my property, you're not spending more than 35% of your income on rent. We make sure to cap that. But you are spending a lot. But you could never supplement or augment public education with a tutor. We give it to you for free. Safety and security. I mean, it's amazing how violence and how an unsafe environment impacts, handicaps the development of a child's brain. If we can make it safe and secure, so what do I have? I have a Secretary of Defense, Randy Slaughter. Perfect name. Randy is a former Marine, then he worked for the Drug Enforcement Agency, then spent 20 years working as a gang task force member of the Anaheim Police Department. His job is to enrich our communities with safety and security. So what does he do? He walks down to the local police precinct. And we recruit three or four law enforcement agents and their families. And we subsidize housing for those police agents and their families. And what's the currency they pay us? Number one, if they're assigned a squad car, park it out front. Because nothing dissuades violence than a squad car. Number two, you've got to live in my property. You can't sublet it. Number three, make your presence known. When the Girl Scout troops that we fund, when the little girls are selling cookies, walk door to door with them to make sure that residents in the community know that here's a wonderful little girl selling cookies. And by the way, you're a law enforcement officer who lives in this community. It is a community. Number four, organize and oversee a community watch program. When this occurs, what we see is violent crimes and incidences that originate from our properties oftentimes drop by in excess of 50% in under a year. So if 911 calls drop from 99 a month to 99 a year, guess what else falls? Insurance costs. Well in excess of the $36,000 I forewent in subsidized rent for the law enforcement agents. And the third area is for health care, because most of our tenants are underinsured and uninsured. So we subsidize housing for nurse practitioners. In many instances, we have virtual, not virtual, we have kiosks that we partner with federally qualified health clinics, where we provide health fairs and we provide free health care for our families. So again, if you live in our property, you're spending a lot in rent, but you could never afford to augment your lifestyle with education, safety, and health care. And the simple fact is, is they don't move. Now, while in abstract that sounds interesting, but let me give you real proof. In under 18 months, with the brilliance and the help of our friends at Freddie Mac, good plug? Good plug? Uh, Freddie Mac? They have provided $175 million of financing to the Turner Multifamily Impact Fund so that we've been able to buy 13 properties across the country in some of the most economically challenged neighborhoods, 4,500 units. To date, we've enriched our communities with over 12,000 hours of safety, health care, and education. To date, we have driven tenant satisfaction from below 30% when we buy the properties to over 75%. And what we get in turn for this pride in rentership, it's led to an increase in profit margins by number one, an 11% increase in our lease durations, number two, a 15% drop in economic loss, reduced deferred maintenance costs because families care about where they live, and in many instances, a 50% drop in instances, what I call doing good and doing well, social impact investing. And again, as I said, under David's and, and, and Mr. Layton's leadership, you all have been magnificent, and I'm here to applaud you in front of everybody because it's amazing what you're doing. But the reality is, is what we're doing, what Freddie Mac is doing, isn't enough. When you have 15 million families that are spending 60% of their income on rent, it's just not sustainable. So as my friend and business partner Andre Agassi likes to say, it's easy for most people to dream while they're asleep. But those that have the courage to dream while they're awake, it's those of you that will change the world. So I'm hopeful that while you're here over the next couple days in beautiful Phoenix, that you can all find the courage to dream a little bit while you're awake, to work together to collaborate, maybe even conspire to create scalable, sustainable, and yes, profitable solutions that can tackle some of our most daunting challenges. Making change both financial and societal, societal has never been more critical 
to our country, and it's never been more rewarding as an investor. So a few weeks back, um, I had a partner from a New York investment bank at my house out in Los Angeles, and like most alpha dogs, he immediately decided that he had to establish his position in the dog pound, which was my dog pound, by the way. And as my wife and I were giving him a tour of our, our home, he smugly said, he goes, Bobby, do you own this little home? And I'm thinking, asshole. Um, but I thought, particular question, but I'm going to be a bigger man. And I said, yes, I do, I said quite proudly. And he said, really? Well, how large is your property? I'm thinking, oh, now we're measuring things. OK. Um, well, I think it's about 60 feet wide and about 100 feet deep. And he smiled and he said, you know, back home at my estate in Greenwich, Connecticut, he goes, I get up in the morning and I get in my car around 9 AM. And I start to drive. And I drive and I drive. And I drive and I drive and I drive. And it's not till about 6 PM that I get to the other end of my property. To which I respond that I once had a car like that, too. <laughs> the reality is when all is said and done, it's not going to be about what kind of car we drive or what kind of house we have or how much money we have. It's going to be making a difference in the world. And I just implore upon you with my 30 years of experience that doing good and doing well aren't exclusive. They're symbiotic. And I have to tell you, I wish I'd had the courage to have done this many, many years ago. But I left Canyon about four years ago. 25 people came with me. We've raised a billion dollars. We are now 36 full-time employees. We are 75% diverse. We are 50% women. And we are 100% fanatical about making a difference in the world. Now, if I haven't filibustered the entire 45 minutes, uh, David, do we have any time left for any questions and answers? First, uh, uh, everyone, just join me first in a round of applause for Bobby. That was inspiring. It was great. It was funny. We were so proud. Please, you could join us. Let me grab a seat over here. Uh, and we're happy to take questions from the audience. I'll maybe get us started. But uh, I think there's probably microphones, uh, uh, as Bobby had indicated before. The lights are kind of bright up here. So By the way, Bobby is the one on stage right. Yep. Just in case. Who's got more glare coming off their head? Let's. Uh, um, but again, Bobby, uh, thank you so much for joining us. That, uh, that was a great message uh, for us for this, uh, uh, this conference. And uh, we're, we're just so thrilled to be your partner and, and what you're doing. We want to support you in any way we can. I want to start with, um, I mean, you, you clearly focused on how you leverage private capital, as, uh, as are we. But I'm just curious, I mean, do you see any uh, uh, enlightened public policy out there, any cities, any programs that you think are good models? that could, could help you in, uh, uh, in some of the initiatives you're launching? Well, I think it's critical in many instances, particularly as it pertains to building new. If, in fact, the cost of construction, the cost of land, the cost of labor, the cost of financing is so prohibitive, given the parameters of reaching affordability, then we're going to have to partner uh, with the, the, the other stakeholders, which are the government, to help provide incentives. Mm -hmm. um, when you go to certain cities in, in Texas, it could be Houston, it could be Dallas, they have some very novel, innovative ideas of how to incentivize private equity capital to invest in preserving the affordability or building new affordable housing. So it could be as simple as how about waiving real estate taxes? That can drive profit margins dramatically. Um, if we're building ground up, how about waiving um, the 18-month conditional use permit and the expenses associated with environmental permitting. I was uh, uh, very uh, lucky, uh, uh, maybe I was unlucky, to be the keynote speaker at the LA Business Council's uh, annual mayoral housing summit last year. And um, they asked me what I thought the biggest challenge to success in Los Angeles was. And this is in front of city council and about 500 other people. And I said, the biggest problem we face in Los Angeles and our growth is a morally bankrupt city council. <laughs> to which Did they appreciate that. Um, there was, it, I mean, it was dead silence. Um, and uh, Herb Weston, who was the uh, you know, president of city council, you know, I'm, I'm looking at him, and he's, he's seething. And I said, let's be serious. I said, we have a housing crisis in Los Angeles. We have an educational crisis in Los, La in Los Angeles. Uh, we have a HIPAA problem, which is um, a, a shortage of primary care doctors in some of the most underserved communities. All I want to do is build community serving infrastructure. And all you all want to do is get reelected. And the fact that I have got to go through an 18 month conditional use permit and be subject to the vagaries of whatever you're feeling that day, whoever has written your most recent check, that 
I don't have as of right zoning is unconscionable. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. So there are cities, I mean, Houston's one of the greatest cities that there is no zoning. I mean, you can build whatever you want. Mm -hmm. um, that has a good side and that has a bad side as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think that to tackle the issue of you know, market-driven affordable, affordable housing, we're going to have to find partnerships uh, with the government and create incentives so that it does become economically feasible to attract market rate capital. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Uh, do we have questions? I, I, uh, uh, we have, uh, I see uh, Andy uh, Wild here in the front. Uh, is that you, Andy? Yeah. Uh, uh, why don't we just get a microphone, or, or if you want to belt it out, we can repeat it. Uh. Such a great question. Do you want to, you want to repeat it? So the question was, is how do we ensure the affordability in perpetuity? Because, I mean, what could be more disappointing to me or disheartening than to spend 10 years of my life building this portfolio of 20,000 units only uh, to sell it to a more predatory investor who looks at my business model and says, dumb business model, and, and all of a sudden improves and enriches it. Um, so it is a challenge I worry about every day. Um, there is a limited universe of socially like-minded investors out there, uh, like the Prudential Insurances of the world, like USAA, who will buy and preserve affordability um, because it's built into their, their corporate legislation, uh, but not enough. I mean, they're not going to buy 15 million units. Um, so my business model is, is that once I've had 20,000 units, I do plan to take this, uh, this platform public on the New York Stock Exchange. Because I do believe that there is a, a, a tsunami of interest in the investment community looking for investment opportunities that have a double bottom line, that do good and do well. And my goal is, and I've met with numerous investment banks uh, and, and uh, underwriters who believe that if you can drive the same funds from operation um, as a Lexington uh, multifamily REIT or, or a, uh, an equity residential, and they are uh, you know, buying a portfolio and, and managing a portfolio of, of luxury housing, if you can generate the same FF&O and, and, and cash flow, uh, and at the same time, built into the uh, constitution of this public company is the preservation uh, of affordability. Uh, they actually believe that that model will sell at a premium uh, from their lips to, to, to my ears at some point. Uh, but I, I do believe, as I, as I travel the country and I preach the gospel of impact investing, that I think that there is, is a tsunami of capital that is looking for opportunities to do good and do well, and this will be one of them. Megan, uh, uh, remind folks there's microphones uh, scattered around. Oh, we have uh, yep. someone over there. Let's hey, Bobby, Robert Shepard here. Uh, thanks for the talk. You've taken a very unique approach to this challenging problem. Want you just in answer the one of the questions I had. So the second question is, do you obviously have come up with a, a unique methodology in operating the assets that uh, has taken advantage of the core, you know, some of the core cost problems that are, uh, do are prevalent in the affordable workforce housing space. So how do you take that concept and, and basically convert some of the market rate operators out there who really don't have that perspective? And are those metrics something that you're gonna share or how are you gonna go about that? Well, A, I keep doing more of this. Uh, I'm not a, I don't like public speaking. Um, and, and, uh, but for, for me, it's, it's the legacy I wanna build. So that, you know, my daughter about four years ago um, came home to me and, and, and said, Dad, you know, why do you look so, ha so unhappy? And I said to her, is it that obvious? And she goes, yeah, it's, it, it's that obvious. And she goes, well, you know, what's your legacy going to be? What do you want your epitaph to read? And I said, sweetie, Daddy went to Wharton. I have no idea what epitaph means. <laughs> um, to which she said, what do you want your tombstone to read? I'm like, really? We're having that conversation. Um, and I said, you know, when, when Daddy was, was 20 and graduated, the Wharton School was very simple. I wanted my, my epitaph to read, Daddy had the most change in his pocket. But, you know, in your 50s, and I will truly tell you that, you know, wisdom is wasted on the elderly. Uh, and as you get wiser, I realized that it didn't, I didn't want it to read that Daddy had the most change in his pocket, but rather Daddy made the most change in the world. So my job is, is to do this more and more often. Um, anyone can call me. Our website has our business model, but it's not rocket science. It's just having an understanding of how to tackle and be sensitive. And, 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 you know, sympathy is great, but nothing beats empathy. And when I talk about, you know, the team that we've built, uh, we are every shape, size, color, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, but we're also of the community. 
I mean, a number uh, of the, the people that work for me grew up in public housing. So we were able to bridge that gap between arrogance and distrust, arrogance from capital providers who assume we know what the problems are and how to solve them, and distrust from communities who believe we're just there to make money. And when you can sit down and you can empathize, it changes the whole dynamics of these, these, these models. That's fantastic. I mean, let me add uh, just a different, uh, different angle. Um, I think it's what's on most people's minds is, uh, have you ever actually played basketball with Magic Johnson or tennis with Andre Agassi? So I, I have made three critical mistakes in life. Number one is I'm a closet guitarist. And I thought that I was good. And, and one night, uh, Lindsey Buckingham, do you all know who Lindsey is? Sure. Fleetwood Mac. Lead, lead guitarist for Fleetwood Mac and, and a good family friend. And, and Lindsey and I went out one night and we had dinner and um, we went back to uh, a studio and I said, Lindsey, would you mind playing? And I had written a song. And I no pushed it across the table and I said, would you mind playing this? And he goes, I'm not going to play that. And I said, really? He goes, I'm not going to play that. I said, you come to me all the fucking time asking for financial help. Play my song. <laughs> he goes, I'm not going to play that. I said, why are you not going to play that? He goes, because I don't read music. Oh. I'm like, you don't read music? And then I said, God, I'm a shitty guitarist. <laughs> so I have played basketball with Magic Johnson, and there is zero upside. Um, <laughs> I have played tennis with Andre Agassi, mm -hmm. and I will tell you that I, for those who play tennis, anyone play tennis? Uh, UST, so I'm a 5.0 on, on, in, in, for tennis. So I'm a good player. Yeah, that's pretty good, yeah. And I thought, you know, I'm gonna get some game. I'm gonna get some points. And what I've learned is that on Andre's worst day of tennis, playing with the racket in his left hand, and by the way, the racket is a Barbie doll tennis racket, <laughs> I will not get a point. All right. So I no longer play my guitar, I don't play basketball, and I don't play tennis any longer. But you tr uh, uh, you've tried. But I, but I have tried. It's not uh, a lot of fun. Uh, got it. Uh, again, going to just scan if we have questions. Um, I have a question. Oh, there we go. Um, one of the things you didn't talk about was driving down utility costs through energy efficiency. And I wonder if you have a focus on that and if that helps you with your investors. Um, the answer is, is we have two lead certified professionals that work at Turner Impact Capital and built into our DNA is what we call a triple bottom line. We want financial returns, we want social impact, and we want environmental responsibility. So again, when we're working with Freddie Mac, uh, we get discounts in, in pricing, not only because we're investing in low and moderate income communities, but we are committed to you know, looking at our carbon footprint uh, with regards to uh, water usage, with regards to utility costs, with regards to energy efficiencies. So the answer is yes, it is, is part of our three-legged stool. Good question. I want to go, uh, uh, actually, I, I'm sorry, I think I saw a question. Uh, Scott. Um, you just mentioned public housing, there's millions of you know, underutilized and you know, lower quality and unfair. Why is people applying to this there and it's now being partnered? Um, you're asking me to partner with the government if we're going to do subsidizing appliance housing, and my life is just too short. I used to have a full head of hair, <laughs> and for every zoning meeting I went to and every problem I had with a politician, I pulled out a piece of hair. I'm now <laughs> onto my back. So. <laughs> No interest whatsoever. That was, I think that was a relatively that was, clear answer. Uh, was, <laughs> uh, I just want to go back a little bit, um, uh, and certainly uh, I see how things can change over time, and, and it sounds like perhaps uh, having more success, but uh, in some conversations we've had uh, with some of the pensions have been uh, disheartened to see where there's still this uh, reluctance to consider social impact in terms of their investment. I'm just curious uh, if, you, uh, if you've seen that change, if you see greater opportunity there uh, um, in the future. I have not. So I had to reinvent my, my client base uh, when I left Canyon after 20 plus years, uh, whereas my traditional investors were the CalPERS, CalSTRS, Texas Teachers, New York Common. None of them are my investor at mm -hmm. this point. Um, and it will take time. Um, it takes education, it takes a willingness for them to listen, but it also takes a uh, track record. Mm -hmm. Now, regardless of the fact that, uh, you know, Magic and I had a 20-year track record, regardless of the fact that we're doing schools and housing, um, you know, most public pension funds, um, and, and I want to say this as kindly as possible, they're not paid to take a lot of risks. No. Um, there is a, a, a unique relationship between amount of capital under management uh, and, and what you pay people mm -hmm. to manage that capital. 
And I think that prevents um, innovation at these organizations. But I think with time, uh, there will be political pressure. But again, their, their job is, you know, I always say, how is it possible for CalSTRS uh, or, or CalPERS not to want to invest in the very communities in which their pensioners come from? Makes a lot of sense. They're not worthy of an investment of their own capital. I think they would be if you ask them. But uh, I've had very little success. The vast majority of my investors have been um, uh, pension funds, banks, because all of my investments, uh, not all, but the vast majority qualify for Community Redevelopment Act mm -hmm. credits, which is helpful to get bank money. Um, uh, so banks, insurance companies, lots of, 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 of foundations, the Rockefeller Brothers mm -hmm. Fund, uh, the Kellogg Foundation, and these are, and I don't fall under their PRI or MRI, because I'm not interested in being some sort of sacrifice and yield. This comes out of their core uh, portfolio. And I've always told it, you know, philanthropists, you know, anyone like me, I was frustrated as a philanthropist. I was just funding legacies of dependency. Stephen Hines, who was the executive director of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, about a billion um, uh, in capital out of Harlem, uh, he did a white paper. He hired, it was either McKenzie or Mercer, about uh, five years ago to do a white paper, a study of the lasting impact that the Rockefeller Brothers Fund's philanthropy had had over the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. They'd given away a billion dollars. And the result was, the response was from the consultant was, you really just funded legacies of dependency. Now, I try to tell people, you know, philanthropists, don't worry. Social impact is not going to put you out of business because there's a myriad of issues in society that cannot be tackled with a for-profit solution. I have not figured yet how to make money off of teenage pregnancy. I haven't figured out how to make money off of childhood obesity or recidivism. But when and where there is a market-driven solution to tackle the same issues that you have or mission as a philanthropist, why are you not directing your core portfolio into that? Why are you investing in hedge funds and long shorts and, and stock markets when you could be investing in a real estate fund that's not building high-end condos, but buying and preserving affordable housing? We're making a tremendous amount of progress there. Okay, which is great. Um, anybody, uh, uh, I see one over here. One of, one of the legs of, of your investment stool is education, and charter schools have varying degrees of acceptance state by state. Arizona is much better than most. What are you, what are you seeing and, and what's happening in that charter school area to make them more acceptable and, and give them more of a, a wide well, so acceptability? Let's so recognize, that, so that works. number one, that charter schools are public schools. They operate independent of the public school district, which tends to create this, this adversarial relationship between the teachers' unions and the public charter schools. But the answer is, is one of the questions is, who doesn't want freedom of choice for parents? I can't think of anyone other than maybe a school teachers' union. Because charter schools don't steal kids from public schools. Parents pick up and move their kids because the public schools are failing to educate them. I mean, imagine in any city if firefighters only fought fires one out of every third day, or policemen would only you know, arrest one out of every four. Well, if only one in three kids are proficient in math and science in, in, in urban communities, why are you as a parent not provided a choice? Mm -hmm. So part of the challenge is, is, is morally bankrupt politicians. Part of the challenge is campaign finance reform. Because again, who wouldn't want options? Um, the reality is the vast majority of charter schools don't outperform the public school districts. They just don't. I mean, no one starts a charter school with the idea of fucking up a kid's life by underperforming, but the reality is to operate a great charter school, you have to have both educational expertise and administrative expertise. When Andre and I formed our fund, we were very clear that we were not going to scale mediocrity. We don't build schools for mediocre operators. We only build facilities for the very, very best in class, those operators with both an a, a, a academic and a financial track record. The same thing with our preventative health care fund. We're building preventative health care, um, preventative value-based clinics in the same communities we're building schools and buying and preserving housing, but we're only building them for proven, clinically proven and financially successful uh, Medicare Advantage health care providers. Mm -hmm. So again, with time, I would think that voters would have to, you know, Stand up and vote. We talked about before is one of the one things that Donald Trump has done is he has sparked a fire of political activism that I haven't seen in my lifetime. Well, we need that in education too. You have got to vote for officials that are supportive of pro-choice in education. And if you're not, then you're dooming tens and tens of thousands, if not millions of kids to what I would call mediocre educations being relegated to the public school systems. 
and I can't resist following up a little bit as a resident of the District of Columbia. Uh, how would you assess the, the, uh, the approach of the D.C. government now and in, in past administrations? They're fantastic. 40% uh, of Washington, D.C. public schools are now charter. Um, Adrian Fenty uh, did an amazing job uh, at this. His predecessor and his successor, they've all been very supportive of public charter schools, and as a result, uh, they're doing great. And again, no, charter schools don't steal kids unless they have a better product. My idea, you know, you, the gentleman over here asked, what's your sustainability for your business model and housing? I didn't take public offering. You know, my ideal result of our charter school fund is that we will instill just enough competition into the public school systems that they get their shit together. Mm -hmm. If they realize that, my God, people are leaving because there's a better product, we better match. You know, monopolies aren't innovative and public schools were the last great monopoly in this country, and it needs to be broken. Do we have other questions? Oh, we got another one. Thank you, Mr. Turner, for your time. Uh, just a quick question. What couldn't the average person do to make a social impact? I know you said you were discouraged with philanthropy, and that's usually an avenue that most people would use. Well, that's implying that I'm either above average or below average, <laughs> because I think I'm an average person doing social impact investing. Um, it's hard, it's a great question. And one of the reasons that I wanna take our housing fund public is so that the average person can buy into that. But the average person who goes to work every day, I think has the opportunity to influence whatever organization they're working for to implement and employ socially responsible practices. So every day when you go to work, you could say to your boss, you know, we're doing it this way, but what if we thought about this way, and there's a, a justification in a business model that says that if you do it this way, we can be equally, if not more, profitable. What I like is that, you know, when I grew up in, in beautiful Baltimore, Maryland, um, you know, when we were, wanted to be activists, what we would do is we would take some poster board, we'd put it to a broomstick, and we'd walk downtown, and we'd, we'd, that's how we know, no, we won't go. You know, what's amazing today is that there is a changing value system, particularly in millennials, where their objectives, their values, their goals are very different than my generation's. And what's amazing is their activism is not like my activism. Their activism is with their wallet and their purses. Their activism is shopping. Because last year alone, 68% of millennials started supporting a brand that they believed were employing social responsible practices and stopped supporting a brand that they believed were not practicing or employing social responsible practices. So if they had the choice, uh, they, would, they stopped buying Volkswagens, because that's a bad company, and they would start buying Teslas. But the reality is, is that social media has changed the landscape. Never before in the history of this company have corporate, um, corporate reputations been more at risk. CVS, the drugstore, three years ago did something miraculous. They did what? What did they stop selling? Tobacco. Well, if you're a traditional investor, the average investor would say, God, that's a stupid idea. CVS had $100 billion in sales every year. Only $2 billion, well, $2 billion of it was tobacco, 2% of sales. But that $2 billion had 20% profit margins, or $400 million of the cash flow. At a 20 multiple, that's an $8 billion market cap. So if you're an investor, you say, my God, the president and the CEO has just said they're going to stop selling tobacco. We need to short this stock because it's going to drop by $8 billion in market cap because that's a multiple or another on their EBITDA that they just lost. What did the markets do? Within six weeks, their market cap had increased by $4 billion. And I believe it's because of my wife and daughter. Because they came home that day, and they said, Dad, well, one of them said, Dad. And they said, you get, pick which one. Um, and, uh, wow, I threw myself off. <laughs> and they said, we need to support CVS because they are authentic. They're not hypocrites. They are truly a healthcare company that believes it's hypocritical to sell cancer sticks next to cancer solutions. And I think that you're seeing that, that all the ads today are saying, you know, we're socially responsible, we're green, we're this. And I, and I love that. I'm encouraged by the movement and people's demand that corporations not only are responsible for their shareholders, but business is a, a, a force for greater social good. And you'll support brands. So every day you can go out and buy brands that you believe are doing something good. The average person can do that. And you can stop supporting brands. And you can start a blog that says Volkswagen should go to hell. Mm -hmm. One of the things we, uh, we love about uh, at Freddie Mac Multifamily that we, we have a mission and also focused on, uh, on many of the same, uh, same uh, uh, 
issues in terms of affordable housing and workforce housing as you are. And uh, I, think, uh, I think that's part of way, why people come into work every day uh, uh, and give so much of themselves in our, uh, in our company. No, I can't believe we have choice. We have a choice of people that we can borrow money from, and, and this has been, I mean, the reason I'm here is because of you, David. It, it's well, been a fantastic you. partnership. You've empowered us uh, that we know you're our partner. You get in there in the trenches with us, and you look and you underwrite the risks, and you recognize that they're not risks, they're opportunities. Mm -hmm. And for you to reward us by a reduced yield or cost of our debt, uh, that's a partnership. Mm -hmm. And in return, that's why out of the first 13 deals we've done, uh, we've done all 13 with you. And it's, uh, it's I think that's great to hear. Uh, 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 I suppose we should probably end on that note. It's really hard to top that. So, uh, uh, Bobby, it's really been an honor to have you with us. Uh, again, uh, uh, you're an inspiration to all of us. We love doing business with you. We appreciate your making the trip out here, and we look forward to doing a lot more together. Thank Don't you. go changing, David. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.